sitting in for Christina Tobin today. I'm the producer here at Free and Equal TV, and boy, I'm honored. We have an amazing guest for you guys today. Cindy Sheehan is joining us. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to have such a historic figure on our show. I didn't even know this. I was looking into it. You have your own like Encyclopedia Britannica like page. I was like, what do you got to do to get in there? Like, that's impressive. I know I have a Wikipedia. That's not too impressive, but I didn't know Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah, well, they added you. I was doing some research on you, as any good journalist will, and uh, I was doing my homework. So uh, I wanted to get into some interesting topics here, uh, starting out with there's this whole new generation of people that have been born and have become adults since uh, 2005 when you really started. And uh, first of all, let's start out with what got you all into anti war activism because that's what you're known for as well as being an author well um my son casey was killed in iraq on april 4th 2004 and i was had been always against wars my practically my whole life i grew up um pretty much uh during the vietnam war and it actually ended when i was still a teenager so I didn't really do any, uh, I didn't go to any marches or do any protests against the Vietnam War, but I had always been against war. And then when our son, Casey, joined the military, we uh, were shocked because, you know, we weren't a military family. It wasn't anything that we ever encouraged. You know, and as a matter of fact, he always said when he was in high school that he wasn't going to join. And then he uh, got recruited when he was 20 um, and went in when he was 21. So there wasn't really anything that we could at that point really do about it. But then on, um, that was in 2001. And then as before 9-11, and as we know, after 9-11, the U.S. went on some incomprehensible vendetta against the people of Afghanistan and Iraq that actually had nothing to do with right. 9-11 and Casey being in the U.S. military was sent to Iraq in, to Iraq where he was killed and so I just started to uh, try and be plugged in more to what people were doing against the war and actually at the time he was killed there wasn't that much going on because there were a lot of protests before the war started or before the U.S. invaded Iraq, <clears throat> but after it kind of settled down because people said they had to support the troops and they didn't want to see the, the troops to see them protesting the wars. Well, I didn't really buy that, so I started to network with other people that felt similar, similarly to me. And then in 2005, in August, I uh, actually went to confront George W. Bush in Crawford, Texas, where he had his vacation home. And I wanted to ask a simple cause, a, a simple question, what noble cause um, that, that did my son die and so many other U.S. troops and, of course, the people of Iraq. And he, um, I said I was going to stay there until he met with me to answer my question. And he never did, so we set up Camp Casey there, named after my son. And we were there for the month of August, and really uh, like 20,000 people came out to Crawford, Texas that summer to uh, be with us and camp or, you know, just hang out a little bit. And then like tens of thousands of people around the world, um, and even here in the U.S., had solidarity uh, Camp Casey's with us. So... And then after that, I just, uh, since the anti-war movement was reinvigorated, you know, there were a lot of marches, a lot of opportunities for me to get out there and to speak. And um, I was actually on the media a lot. <laughs> and I know this is a long answer <laughs> to, no, your, that's perfect. to your question. So I was on every media, you know, and then that year I was like in magazines, I was like the runner up for the um, time person of the year. I was like in Rolling Stone, you know, just all kinds of magazines and every news thing possible. But then in 2007, I left the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party in 2006 
they, people like Nancy Pelosi uh, lied to me and said that if I helped them regain majority of the House of Representatives and in the 2006 elections, they would help me in the wars. Well, they did gain a uh, majority. Nancy Pelosi became the first female Speaker of the House. And then they went uh, immediately about uh, funding George Bush's wars, not holding him accountable for that. And then so in 2008, I ran against Nancy Pelosi and came in second in San Francisco. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that I've done, but I think the major things that I've done is, you know, obviously going to Crawford, Texas, and then also leaving the Democrat Party, realizing that there's no hope for peace in either Democrat or Republican Party. And um, so I think those are like the two biggest things. And I've, I've stayed fast to, to the not supporting Democrats or Republicans. And it's been hard because a lot of people have, you know, they always, when elections come out, as you know, they always jump on the um, bandwagon of the current Democrat, no matter how horrible that person is. And so there have been like people who are less horrible, uh, you know, like Bernie Sanders, that people always want me to support. And I'm like, no, he's a Democrat. He's always, uh, you know, voted for war funding. And, you know, he he supports the U.S. Uh, project of imperialism if he's voted, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I won't. And look at the current president. We have Joe Biden. I mean, just a complete disaster. I'm not saying Trump was better because I don't support Republicans either. Right. We had but less war, though. When it comes to foreign policy, it doesn't matter who's in the Oval Office. Look at eight years of Obama, you know, and how many people did he kill? How many people did how many countries did he bomb? How many countries did he destroy? Libya. They tried to destroy Syria. They kept the the um, imperial projects going in Iraq and Afghanistan, supported Saudi Arabia in the bombing of Yemen, supported Israel in their, um, you know, colonization of Palestine and their apartheid policies. Yeah, so, so in the issue that makes it is the most important to me, which is the war and peace issue, I see no difference in the two major parties. Yeah, I have to agree. Uh, my story is somewhat a uh, little bit different, but we have some similarities. You know, I found out about Smedley Butler and, you know, a little bit about war being a racket. A lot of people don't even know about the coup to try to take over our United States and make it a military, you know, dictatorship back in the 30s during the Bonus Army March. But, uh, you know, I learned a lot about uh, war being a racket, per se, from a guy in 2011. I came a slightly different path. I came from the Republican path. And then I, I, I bumped into this candidate. His name was Ron Paul. And Ron Paul is like anti-war. He said that, you know, we can't be funding these wars. We have this thing called blowback. The reason why we have so much problems here is because we are becoming the policemen of the world. And that's not our job. We should bring home all the troops. And he said, if you really want to honor the troops, you would listen to the troops. And the troops are saying that this war is a racket and we shouldn't be out there. And it's interesting to see how correct he was. And it was really shocking to me to think about somebody saying, well, what? We don't need war. There's a military industrial complex. And then I started to think about why are we going to war? Why is it that we were told that uh, we needed to go to Afghanistan and turn? And it turns out that Saudi Arabia was behind 9-11. Then Obama said we couldn't sue him, uh, sue them. And we, we start finding out that there is no weapons of mass destruction. And really, it seems like sometimes there's more danger to our freedoms and liberties 10 feet from the White House than there is from overseas. Oh, absolutely. I nobody from Iraq or Afghanistan ever attacked us. So, you know, uh, our enemies are in Washington D.C. And there's not just it's not just the Republicans or the Democrats. It's like 535 of them, um, you know, give or take a few on certain issues that are the enemies of peace and the enemies of the people. 
Yeah, so I have to ask you, how has activism, in your opinion, changed over the last 20 years? Because I'm a protest journalist. I was in the Minneapolis when the 3rd Precinct burnt down. I was in Kenosha with all that crazy stuff that happened here in Wisconsin. And I was in D.C. on January 6th, and I cover a lot of this stuff. But there's been an evolution, I think, over the last 20 years of how protesting has, uh, has worked and how it's being done. Well, um, I only know... You know, I only know since my son was killed, um, and I got started getting involved in 2004 and 2005. But I think there's been um, how has how has it changed? Well, first of all, there's very little anti-war um, protesting. We tried to get something going when Obama was president. We tried to get something going was when Trump was president just very small results compared to how it was when Bush was president, which is very interesting because Obama just continued and expanded Bush's wars. But, you know, when Pete, when he was elected, people didn't want to know about his horrendous foreign policy. And they thought that if we protested him, then that would compromise his chances for reelection. And then if we protested him after he reelected, that would compromise the Democrats chance you know, in 2016, blah, 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 whatever. So I think that um, Democrats really uh, have uh, almost killed an anti-war movement. It's not, it's not dead because some of us are still, some of us are still around, um, you know, working hard to stop the wars. But Democrats also, they worm their way into any movement. You know, they worm their way into the Black Lives Matter movement. They they worm their way into the anti-gun movement, to the anti-war movement. And um, what they try to do, I think, is to send their little operatives and agents into these movements to try and co-opt them to uh, turn in to get out the vote for Democrats. So almost every movement has been a get out the vote turned into a get out the vote movement for um, Democrats. And we've seen that when we vote for Democrats, it's just the same as voting for a Republican. So right. it's not an effective strategy. The only difference between the two parties is the rhetoric. I know at one point in 2012, when Mitt Romney was running against uh, Barack Obama, uh, I think 12 of the 18 top donors were the same. So would mm -hmm. there have been an actual difference if Mitt Romney was elected? We would have had Romney care, which would have been just as unpopular as Obamacare was when it was passed. We would have had, uh, you know, still a expansion of the wars. And what we see here is a corporatized America. Now with social media, uh, you know, activism has become more online but so is censorship trying to prevent certain points of view. I know that rhetoric between the two parties is different, but once they get into voting, when you look at that voting record, there seems to be a major difference, or there's most, excuse me, there seems to be very little difference between how right. they all, all vote, you know? Well, absolutely. I mean, you, you see the rhetoric from some of the, you know, the so-called squad and or whatever, they're uh, like really radical, like, oh, we need Medicare for all, or we need to end the U.S. funding of Israel or whatever. And then when it comes to vote, they vote the way that the party wants them to vote anyway. So people don't so much see that as see their, their fiery rhetoric and they get all fired up and go, yeah, yeah, they're great. They're wonderful. And um, one thing that has really like harmed uh, the anti-war movement is all of the COVID restrictions that have started happening since last March. And so it's a, it's a movement that you can't really do online. You have to be there. You have to be um, in the presence. You have to be with people. You have to, to get solidarity, to get excitement, to, uh, you know, I've been arrested over 25 times to put your bodies on the line for these people in other countries to show solidarity with them. And so, you know, because of COVID, we can't really travel. And I find it interesting that, you know, the Black Lives Matter movements, like you said, in Kenosha, in, or the against police brutality, which I think is a really valid um, protest, it seemed to be more like attracting local people as it was like at the flashpoints 
there were a lot of close people or local people who were able to to muster together to pr protest the uh, police brutality. And uh, that's apart from the Black Lives Matter movement, which seems to have been totally co-opted co by the Democrat Party. So, but it's like the seat of power for the anti-war movement is Washington, D.C., obviously. You know, we could go and protest at, um, at like, uh, war profiteers. There, there's a war profiteer in almost every district or a military base or, uh, you know, a military recruiter or something. But it just doesn't have the same kind of like, okay, let's, we can't say let's uh, boycott Raytheon because none of us are going to be buying drones or anything, you know? Right. So it's just, it just is a different kind of dynamic in the anti-war movement. You know, it's interesting you mentioned drones. I remember sitting down and having a conversation in 2013 with a vet saying that there was a drone program and he was laughing at me and saying there is no drone program. Now they sell them at Best Buy. <laughs> yeah, uh, er, there's definitely a, a drone program, and it's definitely um, very uh, unethical, very uh, appalling that people can sit, you know, in a base tens, not tens of thousands of miles away and kill somebody on the ground in, in another country and just do that like they're playing Fortnite or something. Right. That's uh, that's the new thing. I'm very involved in the futurist movement because I, I think it's really important to bring up the concerns of the ethical uh, stance people have with artificial intelligence and robotics and cloning and all these uh, super soldiers and animal human hybrids, which when, when you think that I'm not talking Minotaur or Centaur, I'm talking about slightly modifying human DNA so they can be more, you know, strong per se, or be re more resilient to certain right. things. So these are all real conversations we're going to start having with war where people won't even have to do battle. It'll be like robots doing battle with robots and what happens when the robots are gone i don't know what happens when the robots <laughs> lose stop you know and turn on us <laughs> yeah right and so we we have to start thinking <laughs> about it movies that look like that it's kind of scary yeah <laughs> that's what i thought when they started talking about uh you know all those different like soylent green and brave new world and uh you know drones are now being discussed as patrolling and how robots will deal and be less uh segregates towards uh, minorities per se if they are police and they're talking about robots and it's funny these robots look like Daleks out of Doctor Who and it's not by chance that somebody did this you know uh, they have that authoritarian feel we're kind of programmed through Hollywood and the media to accept a lot of this stuff and you know war in the future I think is is fought very differently I think that now they're deciding that war starts within the nation by causing political uprise you know division divide and conquer you know nowadays it seems like in america we don't have the stance for unity for anything it's you know husband against wife children against parents this ethnicity against that you know it's almost like it's tribal like we're all on teams and regardless of what beliefs are underneath that umbrella that you don't believe in or don't agree with you have to ad adhere to your team and to me that makes it crazy it's like americans don't even have an original thought anymore it's really pitiful, and it's been really sad to see so many of uh, people who I considered my friends, my colleagues, my comrades, really, like, buy into all the COVID-19 nonsense. And my question to them has always been, okay, so we, just, we know that the government lies about wars. We know the government always lies about wars. There's not one war that the government hasn't lied about, right? And they, the media lies about everything. And so we know this. We know that they, like you said, manipulate our, our feelings for uh, their nefarious purposes and keep us divided over, um, you know, relatively silly things when we should be united against them. And they know this divide and conquer, that's what they do overseas and that's what they do here. But so they're doing this all the time and we know, and my friends and, and comrades and colleagues know this too, but as soon as they start talking about this new scary virus that's coming, people just like 
their critical thinking just goes away. They listen to everything the government uh, and media tell them. And I just cannot understand that. You know, so even if there it was a public health threat and it turned out to be a real public health threat, people should be investigating that on their own and not just taking the word of known liars all the time. It just really has confused me. Well, they've decided to weaponize terms. So they're trying to ban questions is what it all comes down to. You're not allowed to ask questions because then it is uh, ideally it's uh, another term that they like to use as conspiracy theorists. Not that the evidence is, uh, you know, false, just that you are a conspiracy theorist. Like it's a thought terminating cliche that nothing that you have to say has value and it prevents people from acknowledging logic fallacies and cognitive dissonance so they weaponize these words and terms so that you become prey you know everyone wants to trust big pharma and and, and trust government but wasn't it much not too long ago we were marching on monsanto now you can't turn on the tv without a settlement commercial but yet we're so able to succumb to consensus science which isn't scientific it's trust in humans instead of actually you you know having and using a rational thought see fear is a big motivator i think half the world actually enjoys living in fear now you know and it's well, they're, sad they're tra- i call it i say they're trauma bonded yes they're it's narcissistic it's trauma they don't want to give up the idea that they that the uh the healthy person that's walking down the street um next to them is going to make them uh horribly sick and kill them <laughs> you know they don't want to think that, that that this isn't like the huge uh threat that they thought it was going to be because they really have bonded with that trauma And it's just really like, it's pathetic. And another thing that they've done is to this asymptomatic is to make healthy people murderers. You know, it's like the 1984, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, Um, war is peace, two plus two equals five, and health equals murder. You know, there's, there's no such thing as a healthy person anymore. We're all asymptomatic super spreaders. Right. And you can't talk about vitamins. You can't talk about, uh, you know, taking your vitamin C, D and zinc or anything that's uh, sunshine, exercise. I mean, those things were mostly anathema to Americans to begin with. And so then we have to like healthy people, people like me who have like worked really hard to be healthy. I don't just want to live. I want to I just don't want to exist. I want to have I want to be able to do things and you know, run with my grandchildren as long as I can. I I just want to have a life that is worth living, not one where I'm cowering in fear in the corner, you know? And so that's what they've taken away from a lot of people. They've taken away that, like, life isn't just to exist and live in fear, it's to actually live. And, And that's just what has really gotten to me over this past year is how can, like, People have said to me, I'm going off on a tangent, people have said to me, oh, I haven't seen my grandkids for a year. I'm like, why? Well, because of COVID and and the governor said we can't travel or whatever. I'm like, you're an idiot. If you let a governor or a president or big pharma or Fauci tell you you can't see your family or your loved ones, to me, that's super idiotic. And I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody, but just think about it. That, do you think those people have stopped seeing their loved ones? No. Have you have they stopped going out to restaurants? No. Have their kids stopped going to school? No. So why do we have to why do we have to bear the burden for for the profit of their friends and big pharma? You know, when we look at these governors and how hypocritical they've been, like the Michigan governor who kept the golf course open for politicians and, you know, we can't golf, but they can golf. It's almost like an elitist class all across the board. You know, we have to wear a mask, but they don't have to wear a mask. And, you know, in Wisconsin, we had a governor who said that at government buildings, it's not mandatory to wear the mask. So technically the governor or anyone in the, you know, Capitol building building in Madison didn't have to wear a mask. And it's very interesting to 
me how they used the fear button. And now it's the bird flu. It was the Zika. It was the swine flu in 76. Right, right, Every year right. it seems to be something. And Big Pharma wants to sell you that snake oil. And they say even if you get the jab, you know, you still have to wear the, the mask because obviously the jabs aren't working for everyone. And, and not only that, if something you have adverse side effects. Like I have friends who have had severe adverse side effects to this jab. And if they complain about it on Facebook, one of them had their accounts deleted. It's like that crazy. And it's like now they're giving out a hundred million dollars and they have lottos and you get out like they're giving they're throwing the kitchen sink at you. And I don't understand why. If people want it so bad, why they gotta do all this? I don't know. California is giving away at least 116 million dollars. And we have so many homeless people. Yes. We have so many problems. We have a fire season now. We have so many problems with our infrastructure. But they're bribing, they're coercing people to not only get the jabs themselves, but give them to their children. Because even if you don't win one of the $1.5 million prizes or 30000 everybody in your household that gets vaccinated will get a $50 gift card. And like you said, if it's such a good thing, why are they having to bribe people or coerce people, which is a, an international crime, to coerce people to have an untested medical procedure? You know, they're just a, they're just like COVID Nazis. That's what it's come down to. But people aren't standing up against it. And I find that very dis – well, there's a lot of people uh, that have been bravely standing up against it. But I would say most people are just, like, going along with it. And I'm going to get the jab because that means I can see my grandchildren. Or that means I can have parties again. And my question is, why did you ever stop? Yeah, it, it becomes down to the fact that people want to believe in science and it became this new tribalism of science I'm and anti-science. about science. Yeah, I know. I, I, <laughs> all of my information comes from science, too. You know, like you said, the science isn't settled. <laughs> There's like dueling science. And scientists, I think, would even say let's not get into scientism because science isn't always exact we have to test things we have to prove things and we have to do it in a way that it is repeatable you know so yeah it's it hasn't it's not science it's scientism it's the new religion Yep, that is 100% sure because uh, whenever a scientific consensus agrees on something, grab your back wallet because they're coming for it. Uh, to be honest, I always wondered if, uh, you know, this vax and this jab was really a cure, you, you think they would charge a whole lot for it, like something that you need to live like insulin that's like 700 bucks. You know, if they right. really wanted to do so, if they had the cure for cancer, you think they'd give it away for free? Well, we don't know how much the government's paying. I mean, they're getting billions of dollars. We get to take it for free, but... Somebody's paying True. the Facts. the the vax companies for this uh, for this experimental gene therapy uh, concoction. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about. So we come from two completely different wor worlds. I came from the right, you came from the left, but we both can come from the same ideology that basically scientific consensus, it, you know, it's not something, it's trust in people, it's not trust in science, because science is reproducible results. There isn't uh, a consensus arguing whether, you know, E equals MC squared or 2 plus 2 equals 4. And so we must question things. And because we want to ask questions, people will call you a denier or anti-fact and anti-science in fact actually having the debate is science so people out there want to feel safe and they want to feel like they're part of something and that that it's you know science is absolute well it is well that's why we're having issues and we're having this debate but it's sad that they have to censor a whole viewpoint because big pharma has their back pockets in all of social media cindy sheehan it's wonderful having you on uh one last question for you uh, I'd like to go over a little bit about your books. Not one more child in peace, mom. For our listeners out there, what were what's the in depth about those books? Well, it's not one more mother's child. That was uh, mostly my blogs from Camp Casey collated and some articles and things like that. And my book, Peace Mom, um, a mother's journey from heartache to activism, basically was from Camp Casey to like the middle of 2006, I think, of all of the, the things. Well, actually, it was from the time Casey died until the middle of 2000s. And it had many other books, too. So I published seven books. So um, 
So yeah, but that's what those two books are about. And I think it would be hard to find them at this point because they've been so long ago. Yeah, it's but amazing. People can, get a, people can contact me, Cindy Sheehan Soapbox at gmail.com. You know, if they want to ha ask any questions or find out about my other books and my radio show, uh, Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. Thank you very much. It was wonderful having you on the show today. We'll have to have you back soon. And by the way, you're going to be speaking at the Free and Equal United We Stand event in Cambria to help raise money for the Cambria Skate Park Initiative. I look forward to meeting you there. There's so many amazing guests that will be there. Uh, so it should be a good time. People of all beliefs, of all walks of life. Yeah. All right. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Cheers, okay. and have a good day.